Welcome back. We've been discussing airline safety with Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger. Also joining us now is Ali Barami. He is the Vice President of the Civil Aviation Division of the Aerospace Industries Association. Thanks for joining us. Ali, let me start with you this time. What is your assessment of airline safety right now? As we mentioned at the outset of the program, we've had three serious accidents this past month, 460 people killed. Anand, it's absolutely safe. Uh, I think you, all you have to do is take a look at the statistics. In 2013, for example, according to the Flight Safety Foundation, we had the safest year. And at that time, we have over 52 million hours uh, worldwide, 24 million uh, departures, and we have transported 2.9 billion passengers with only 265 fatalities. That is an uh, amazing record, and uh, it's, there's no doubt that the community is continuing to do even better. So what are the uh, improvements that we can see in the years ahead? One of the things that Captain Sullenberger told us was that in the aftermath of the plane that he brought down very safely in uh, 2009, not many things were done. I think you have to understand this business is about managing risk. And what we do, we know we have uh, uh, areas that we need to work on. And when you take a look at where we have been since 1993 and on, uh, well, you will notice that we have introduced technologies, things like uh, uh, TCAS or traffic uh, um, and um, collision uh, avoidance system and enhanced ground sparks, which basically provides uh, protection for the flight crew, situational awareness, and you also have heads up displays and things of that nature that continually improve the situational awareness on part of the pilot. Captain Sullenberg, I have to ask you this, and this is the fate of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. That's the plane that disappeared over the South China Sea. It was on a flight from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. Uh, it's being called the biggest mystery in aviation history. And it remains so. So little is known. And what's particularly interesting is how much we've been to extrapolate from what few data points are available. And that's primarily from those satellite handshakes to determine approximately where to begin looking for this airplane. And that's still in a very large area encompassing 20,000 plus square miles. I think eventually the wreckage is likely to be found. A forensic examination of the entire craft and hopefully analysis of the recorders will provide some information about what happened. I think the more difficult part is going to be to determine how and why and by whom. And firstly, I guess, finding it. Um, Ali, there are new challenges now facing the aviation industry, as we've just seen with another Malaysian Airlines plane going down over Ukraine, and that was brought down by a missile. I mean, what can be done to prevent that happen? That was a tragic event, and um, you need to also recognize that um, what brought that aircraft down was a highly sophisticated and complex system. And even some of the military aircraft do not have that kind of protection. And uh, what is happening today, actually on Tuesday, there was a meeting at ICAO that uh, appropriate organizations such as Air Transport Association and um, airport councils, and they all talked about what we need to do in order to share information with respect to risks that exist today in, in various uh, conflict areas around the world. That would be a good start. And I think that what you find out in our business is that we are very good. The community is very good in reviewing data, um, looking at what's happening, and learn from it. And I think that there would be some good decisions coming out of the reviews when we have got all the facts. All right, so you're saying that there's a lack of information and intelligence right now, enough information to uh, 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 make these planes, these flights safer? Absolutely. I think that, um, as you know, the decision eventually is with the member states to determine the, the safety of their airspace. And that kind of information needs to be shared with the airlines. And that airlines then can do the assessment and the risk assessment to see whether they need to be in certain areas or not. And ICAO, all ICAO can do is provide an avenue where uh, right people can get together and come up with the uh, vehicles to communicate that kind of information. Captain Sullenberger, when we look at aeroplanes right now that fly passengers all over the world, they're getting bigger all the time, uh, their computer power is expanding all the time, they are very, very sophisticated machines. Are they becoming too automated? As we increase the use of technology in all our cockpits, and as we do introduce more complexity, uh, along with that comes new avenues of risk. And so it's imperative that every 
pilot. And each new generation of pilots, as we transition from one generation to the next, has not only these well-learned fundamental flying skills, but in addition to that, a deep understanding of all the airplane systems, especially the automation technology, about when it does what it does. And if it's not doing what it should be doing or what you expect, being engaged and aware enough to immediately and effectively intervene manually if necessary. Because if we look at uh, one of the very tragic accidents that took place, it was the flight, Air France flight, flying from Rio to Paris. Air France 447. Right, it went down over the Atlantic. Yes. Um, and one of the theories was that the plane got into trouble, it was in autopilot mode, and it took some time before the pilots could take it out of autopilot mode and fly it manually. Well, actually, the, the autopilot uh, ceased operation fairly quickly because of a power interruption and the, one of the pilots was manually flying the airplane but did exactly the wrong thing by raising the nose excessively and holding it back and it eventually stalled the wing they lost lift and began a very sudden vertical descent all the way to the ocean it was only very late in the process that the pilots realized the cause of this but by then it was too late so it's again imperative that the the pilots understand it intimately a very deep level of understanding all the technologies and be able and to immediately intervene to take control of the airplane manually. So with this increasing technology, increasing complexity, it, it, it produces, some, produces some challenges as well as safety benefits. It's, it's a mixed blessing. Yeah, what's your view on that, Alan? You know, this is a, an age-old question and how much automation is adequate. And I think that we know that um, when you have systems, it's always helpful from situational awareness, but training becomes an integral part of it. Issues such as human factors, man-machine interface, those are the issues that are being reviewed. As a matter of fact, um, uh, the recent uh, uh, industry working group taking a look at what needs to be done in terms of training and the focus for the uh, flight crews. Uh, to move forward uh, in those kinds of crises that they're facing, I think was going to be very helpful when some of those recommendations are implemented. And I would add, too, that it's the, the training of the interaction among the crew of pilots, Absolutely. the leadership skills, the team building skills, the awareness, the monitoring, yeah. assisting skills. If, if the other pilot isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing, you, you announce it, you begin to correct it. If the airplane isn't doing what it should be doing, you announce it, you begin to correct it. You support each other as a team. We need to take what is a, a team of experts and help them to be an expert team. And those are slightly different skills. Absolutely, thank you. Right, what about planes on the ground? I mean, how often are planes checked, Ali, for their airworthiness? I mean, we see sometimes, I mean, I travel in the United States, planes land, the turnaround time is really fast. I mean, they offload those planes, load them up, they're back in the air. You know, what, what's really important is before you design an aircraft, you consider the mission. You figure out what needs to be done, what type of operation conditions, what kind of maintenance you need to, to put in place, how many hours you need to do a check of certain equipment. So all of that goes into consideration. So, uh, and then also there are, um, if you will, a troubleshooting uh, checklist that uh, that uh, maintenance folks have and based on the reports they check those and if there's something that is critical they will not go forward captain Sullenberger, um are you still flying i mean at the controls i do i retired from the airline about a year after the hudson flight after over 30 years but flying is still a lifelong passion for me and i'm a general aviation pilot i, I use an airplane for business trips and family trips it's and i still enjoy it but Ali, i want to look at something else and that is um you know, when we look at these accidents that took place, like the Malaysian Airlines plane being brought down by a missile, there was an Algerian flight that went down in bad weather, and then, of course, MH370, which disappeared in South China. Um, insurance companies are now becoming a little bit wary of insuring uh, certain routes. I mean, is that going to make, for instance, you know, over the Middle East or over Africa, where there is, where there are, there is violence, there are war zones, where there's a danger that they could be brought down, uh, does that... Lead, could it lead to a situation where certain parts of the world might become inaccessible to the general public? That, uh, that's an interesting question in the sense that uh, when you do your risk assessment before you actually go into those areas, some of that goes into the decision process that you have to make. You're uh, absolutely right. When there are um, directives to not go into certain regions or don't do flyovers in certain parts, 
If the airlines do not consider that, of course, they are taking a massive risk, but those are the decisions they make based on the business decision and their situational awareness from intelligence and also what they get from the country that is responsible for the airspace. I think what's very important is, is what uh, has been talked about already is that the international aviation community going forward have more timely and more accurate, more specific threat information available to all the airlines so that they can uh, intelligently choose which areas to fly over or to fly to. And uh, if you look at the aviation industry, I mean, it's a growth sector, isn't it? It's not going to get smaller. No, it's, oh, no, it's not. Yeah. But there, there are often alternative ways to route an airplane around certain areas of threat. Uh, because, I mean, if you look at a picture, and we often see these pictures on television of, say, just the United States, if you look at an aerial picture of the number of planes, the entire country seems to be carpeted with planes. Uh, you know, there seems to be no space between them. Thousands of flights are born at any one moment. And, but it's, it's still safe. It is. There's, uh, and, and worldwide, you're looking at 100,000 operations a day. Uh, that's an amazing number, and, and f frankly, uh, community as a whole has done a tremendous job to get us to where we are with respect to safety. Right, you have national organizations like the FAA here in the United States, which regulates air traffic uh, and planes. Um, is there an international body that regulates this? I, I think uh, ICAO, which is uh, really an agency under the UN um, that um, brings all these uh, states together, and what they do is de develop um, standards and recommended practices based on views from expertise from um, uh, the authorities, the member states, and uh, organizations, uh, operators, and manufacturers. And I think that kind of information then is communicated. They do not have enforcement action. That's a key element. They do, they do recommend practices, but then it comes down to the member states to have the will and the, the, the means to actually enforce some of those. Oh, I agree completely. Uh, the standards and recommended practices globally are important but it's up to individual countries to mandate that their airlines, that their pilots follow high standards. And there is great variation around the world to these standards and practices. But airline trouble still remains one of the safest yes. ways of getting wrong. Yes, uh, we, it's incumbent upon all of us to continue working hard around the world to make it even safer. And, and I think one thing is really important. Um, what is really amazing about uh, the will of this community is pursuing what they need to do to figure out what went wrong. I mean, even Air France, you mentioned, it took over two years to recover the recorders, right. yeah. and nobody gave up. They continue on, and that is something that is uh, extremely valuable and is going to help us to overcome some of these challenges that we recently faced. Right, and the search continues for MH370. Gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us, Ali Barami and Captain Sullenberger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.